Well, it's gone 10 o'clock, so maybe we should introduce ourselves. Right, okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Nadia Kenar, and I am a research associate with the UK Data Service. This is a workshop um, demonstrating how to map crime data in R. All materials today will be available via the GitHub link. These include the data sets that we will use. This will include um, how to download the data sets, as well as the R markdown file that include the code demonstration. There is also, I'd like to point you to a blog that I wrote for the UK Data Service. It just provides a really good kind of introduction to GIS and spatial data. Um, I suggest kind of reading that after the workshop if you are interested in a real world example. The workshop will follow this breakdown. We'll start with a quick presentation and introduce kind of some main topics in GIS and spatial data. The topics covered in this workshop are only kind of like introductory, but they will help to understand um, the code demo that is run in the second half. I mean, it'd be impossible to cover every topic in GIS and spatial data in such a short workshop, but of course there are loads of readings online that can expand the content provided in these slides. The code demo, we're breaking down into three main topics. We'll start with topic one, which explores our crime data, more specifically how to turn non-spatial data into spatial data. Topic two will then introduce the use of shapefiles and how to join this to spatial data. And then topic three will then cover some topics around census data and the differences between crime rate and crime count. So let's get started with uh, the workshop. So what exactly is GIS? GIS or graphical information systems are a theoretical framework that allow for the creation and analysis of spatial and geographical data. It can be viewed as quite an abstract platform that integrates data onto a map through various methods. GIS is present in virtually every field and every organization as it's a way to share information and to solve complex problems around the world. The biggest benefit allowing for trends and patterns to be studied visually. GIS has quite an interesting history. It started around the 1960s by a pioneer named Roger Tomlinson. He was commissioned by the Canadian government to create a usable and efficient inventory of its natural resources. He tried various manual methods for overlaying environmental, cultural and economic variables but all were too costly or too timely so he introduced the kind of first automated computing system and he was known as the father of GIS. From there we have researchers such as Laura and Jack Dungamond who developed the Environmental uh, Systems Research Institute also known as ESRI which is um, a software developed for mapping and spatial analysis. There are various softwares available um, including Geoda, ArcGIS, FME, QGIS, and R. All of these softwares kind of allow for spatial data analysts, geovisualization, spatial autocorrelation, and spatial modeling. This workshop obviously will be using R and its IDE R studios due to the increasing amount of packages that have become available for spatial analysts and mapping. Um, so GIS are kind of known to produce two broad types of maps. These are known as reference and theometric maps. Reference maps tend to highlight natural patterns or synthetic features, including the positioning and heights of mountains or the layout of bus routes. This type of map is simply referencing what exists in our physical environment. On the other hand, we have theometric maps, which are used to highlight a spatial relationship. Geometric mapping is how we map a particular theme to a geographic area. It tells us a story about a place and is commonly used to map subjects such as climate issues, population densities, or health issues. I like to re um, refer to like reference maps to mean to pinpoint data onto a map, and they can be quite descriptive, whereas theometric maps tend to study a theme within a map and they tend to be more explanatory. Even still, um, the differences between reference and theomatic maps can become confusing. So I've created a few example scenarios to question whether, the, whether they fall within the description of reference or theomatic maps. So if you'd like to head over to um, Mentimeter, you can participate in the quiz 
and we can kind of discuss some different scenarios that draw on um, reference or theoretic map examples. I think Sorsha will pop the code for Mentimeter into the chat. Um, it's also at the top of the screen. Yes, I'll put it in the chat now. Perfect. Um, and we'll just give you a minute to, to head over to Mentimeter, pop in the code at the top of the screen, and yeah, we'll, we'll get going with the quiz. I'll just give you a few seconds to do that. <clears throat> all right, uh, hopefully we're all there and have Mentimeter up and going. So let's start with uh, scenario one. The visualization of road networks to improve road safety measures are a type of, uh, is the quiz available? Sorry. Uh, perfect, okay. Thanks for that, Julia. Um, it looks like the pie chart has stopped moving. So let's go ahead and kind of discuss uh, the results that we see here. At first glance, this might be said to be a type of reference map as we are pinpointing existing road networks onto a map. However, this might also be said to be a type of theometric map as we are studying the existing road networks to then improve the road safety measures which can be seen as a type of accident analysis. Um, one example, for example, might be the introduction of speed signs or zebra crossings outside schools or residential areas due to reports of accidents or dangerous driving. So what we are doing here is studying spatially the relationship between road networks and accidents. And then we are mapping a particular theme to a geographic area. So this kind of, Thematic example um, does include the aspects of a reference map, but because we are using it to study spatially a theme, we can say that this is a type of thematic map. We'll now move on to scenario two. The visualization of the Earth's surface showing its elevation is a type of reference thematic or not sure. Just pop in your answers again. We'll give it 30 seconds to a minute just to let these answers roll through. Results are still coming in, but it looks like the majority of people, 79%, think that this is an example of a reference map. 74 now, results are shifting, results are shifting. We'll just give this another 10 seconds, see if anyone's got any last minute votes. All right, so we have 74% of votes coming in at reference maps, 13% are theoretic, and 13% I'm not sure. Oh, 75 now. Um, but the majority definitely sitting at reference map. The visualization of the Earth's surface showing its elevation can be seen to be a reference map. This is kind of uh, a type of topographic map, which tends to refer to the graphical representation of the three-dimensional configuration of the surface of the Earth. In short, it is simply describing where the Earth's surface is elevated. These maps are normally represented by contour lines. I'm pretty sure you might have seen them if you've ever been on any type of walk or any type of um, DOV activity, you would, have, you would have seen these. Um, however, you might also see this as a type of reference map. Research has suggested that studying a topographic map is a great way to learn about how to match terrain features with the contour lines on a map such as the uh, steepness of the terrain, the shape of the terrain, or whether above or below sea level. 
So in this instance, you might interpret that we are studying spatially the relationship of contour lines to different features of the Earth. So if you answered any of the options, then you can consider yourself to be correct. We're going to head over to the last scenario, which is whether we see navigation tools such as Google Maps or City Mapper to be classed as diamatic reference, or again, there's an option for not sure. Give you 30 seconds to a minute on this one again. All right, it looks like most uh, votes are in and it seems that 52% or roughly 50% of people think that uh, this example is a type of theometric map. Uh, we also have 38% people who think this is reference and 13% who are not too sure. And that's okay. Exactly, it's absolutely okay not to be sure about these things. Um, because when I first read this scenario, I immediately thought that this was an obvious type of reference map because it highlights important features, physical features, needed for travel, such as bus routes, walking routes, cycle lanes, and typically you might even have options for um, cab or taxis. However, reference maps might portray a basic set of features, such as coastlines, terrain, or transport routes. But can we say that an app that plans your travel is a type of reference map? If it uses algorithms to get you from one place to another, normally choosing you the fastest route or the cheapest route, can we call this a type of theomatic map instead, since it's overlaying information on a bus map, on a base map, sorry. Um, interestingly, researchers consider navigation tools to be fundamentally different from both reference and theomatic maps, which kind of opens debate for a third category. It could be argued that all maps are navigational, depending on how you use them. The difference is that like a digital map one that is specifically interactive. But this links us back to um, the, the uh, sorry. So like one main difference between reference and thematic maps is that thematic maps tend to be more interactive, which is why navigation tools might be considered to be a type of thematic maps. Either way, the answer is open to debate and the difference between the two kind of depends on whether we are mapping places or whether we are mapping data. So we can answer these questions by looking at a more detailed real life example. And this is the example of tube maps. Some people might class tube maps to be uh, reference maps because they show the location of different tube stations and the location of each tube line. However, recent research has showed that, thematic, that tube maps can also be thematic because they can be used to predict life expectancy, poverty, and medium house prices. This was a study called uh, Lives on the Line. Most governmental statistics are mapped according to official geographical units, such as wards or lo lower layer super output areas. And while such units are really important and essential for data analysis and making decisions about like governmental spending, they are hard for people to relate to and they don't particularly stand out on a map. This is why they tried a new method to show life expectancy statistics in a fresh light by mapping them on the London tubes, on the London tube grounds. So what can we sum up? Although maps fall broadly into two categories, our reference and thematics, there are ways in which these maps can overlap or share similarities. Almost every thematic map could be considered to be a reference map, but not every reference map could be considered to be thematic. The decision is up to you. It's not entirely necessary to define these in your work, but it is important to know what type of map you want to make as these can be affected by the data you have. So we'll just kind of pause for a minute. Um, oh, already got an answer in, that was my bad, sorry. But if you can think of any kind of um, maps that you think share qualities of both thematic and reference maps, here's an opportunity for you to just kind of note down some answers. We're also just going to have a little two minute break here. So feel free to get up and stretch your legs or grab a glass of water. But any examples, just, just pop them in Mentimeter again.
Wow, so we've got really um, good examples coming through at the moment. We have bus maps, world maps, crime data overlaid on maps, walking routes in the highlands, COVID death cases visualised on world maps. They keep coming through. There's so many. This is this is good to hear. Um, I'm not going to go through each example, but one which draws importance to this workshop is the crime data overlaid on maps. The reason why I drew on these scenarios is just to kind of get you thinking about how reference and geometric maps can be overlaid. And this is exactly what we cover in our crime demo. Um, it seems the answers are still coming in. So I'm just gonna give it another like 30 seconds just to kind of get these opinions flowing. Um, heat maps is also a really good example. They definitely highlight, um, you need a base map as well as additional data overlaid on top of these, which is in this example, using homicide rates. Really good example there. Time zone maps, also a really good example. Again, they include some sort of base map that they have overlaying additional information that tells us something spatially um, about a theme. Fear of crime, also really good. Um, similar to kind of the crime data overlaid on maps covers the same kind of topics. But yeah, uh, we're going to move on to the next topic now, which is spatial data. What exactly is spatial data? In short, it is a representation of the real world. Spatial data, or also known as geospatial data, is a data frame that contains information about a specific location, which can then be analysed to better understand that location. And GIS enables this spatial data to be processed and analysed. So there's quite a strong relationship between GIS as this kind of like abstract platform and then spatial data as um, more of the upfront statistical tool. There are typically two types of spatial data, vector data and raster data. I'm not going to cover raster data too much, but just for anyone who is interested, it typically refers to imagery or satellite data that are formed from a grid of pixels. Vector data, on the other hand, is much more common and consists of points, lines and polygons. Vector data is typically used in criminology and social sciences. This is what you would normally expect to use. So we can describe points to mean a pair of coordinates. This might be an X, Y coordinates, or it might be um, a northing and easting coordinates. An example of a point data might be the location of where a robbery report had happened. We then have lines which extend the points and include two or more points. This might be, for example, the street that that robbery was reported on. And then we have polygons that extend the lines, which tend to refer to three or more points. And this might be the area, the city or the ward that that street belongs in. So there's quite a strong relationship between points, lines and polygons. I think it's important to consider um, these three features as integrated and rather than seeing them as separate because you can study points within lines and you can study lines within polygons. You can also study points within polygons. So um, yeah, this is kind of like the main structure of spatial data. In this workshop, we'll specifically be looking at point data and polygon data through the use of shapefiles. But we'll get onto that a little later on. <clears throat> so now we have a basic understanding of spatial data and GIS. This is where we ask, how do we actually pinpoint a location to a map? This is where we use our projection methods. Map projection. Map projection, sorry, try to portray the surface of the earth or a portion of the earth on a flat piece of paper or computer screen. In layman's terms, map projections try to transform the earth from its 3D to its 2D. It's important to note that during these projection methods, the data can become distorted, affecting 
the area, shape, distance, and direction of points. Although there are algorithms in place to kind of control for this, all features of um, all features can never really be preserved. So just keep that in mind. With there are three different types of projection families known as cylindrical, conical, and planar. And within each projection family, there are hundreds to thousands of different types of projections. It can get pretty confusing and they're not completely necessary to know for this workshop, but um, here is a quick, quick example of how different projection methods can um, kind of differ our perceptions of what we see. In this example, I'm showing two different projection methods. On the left, we see the Mercator projection method. And on the right, we see the Gal-Peters projection methods. The Mercator projection method is something that we are very familiar with. This is how we see Earth. This is how we see um, our world. The Mercator uses something called angular conformity, which isn't um, necessary to know, whereas the Gale Peters projection uses something called um, cylindrical map projection. The Peters projection is unique among world maps because the area ratios of all continents are the same as they are in reality. That is, Greenland doesn't seem larger than Africa, whereas um, on the Mercator's map, Greenland is larger than Africa. So the, P the Peters projection excuse me, sorry. On the Peters projection, the continents of Africa and Asia appear quite large, while usually inflated polar regions such as like Canada and uh, maybe even Greenland shrink back to their proper sizes. The Mercator projection grossly distorts the size of the continents, but stays true to their shapes. So geographically speaking, the shapes are more important. It's far easier to change the scale of a map for different areas of the world than to adjust for the length width ratio as one needs to do with the Peters projection. Um, in addition, the Mercator projection only distorts longitudinal distance, whereas the Peters like kind of messes up the scale almost everywhere from both longitude and latitude. And this is why the Mercator beats out um, the Peters in the world of cartography and why like apps such as Google Maps tend to use the Mercator projection. Um, so yeah, this is kind of just important as it shows us how different map projections can portray different perceptions of countries. We'll be discussing um, projection methods in the crime demo, and we'll be showing how to, to run some of these projection methods. So how do we actually move from the 3D to the 2D? Well, this is done with the help of our CRS, also known as coordinate reference systems, where every place on Earth is specified by three main numbers, known as our coordinates. There are two main coordinate reference systems that are important to know. These are the geographic coordinate reference systems and the projected coordinate reference systems. The geographic coordinate system is a reference framework that kind of defines the locations of features on a model of Earth. It's shaped like a globe and is, and is spherical, whereas the projected coordinate system is flat and it contains a it can get quite confusing, but the projected coordinate system contains the graphical coordinate system, but it converts the graphical coordinate system into a flat surface using different types of projection algorithms and parameters. The decision of which map projection and, and um, coordinate reference system is kind of up to you, and it depends on the regional extent of the area you want to work in, as well as the analysis you want to do and often the availability of data that you have. <clears throat> um, when working with more than one form of spatial data, it's important to ensure that the data is stored in the same CRS or they will fail to line up with the GIS. 
I realise that there's quite a lot of acronyms going on right now. So if you have any questions, we can take a minute to pause and we could um, discuss them in the chat if you need some further clarification. <clears throat> I'd also kind of just like to draw attention to the differences between the projection methods itself and the projected coordinate systems. They are two different things and they tend to be um, overlap, but they should be kept separate. The projection systems itself is just a math like mathematical algorithm, whereas the PCS or the projected coordinate system um, signify how specific round earth models are projected onto a map. So these can be quite, it's quite difficult to understand that, that difference, but just know that one is just a mathematical algorithm. So we've discussed kind of some of the challenges with map projections and coordinate reference systems, but we can, let's tie this discussion back to crime data itself and discuss some of the challenges of mapping crime data. In our workshop, we'll be using open police recorded statistics, but these can be criticised on a few grounds. Firstly, police recorded crime provides point information through the use of GIS. However, the accuracy of spatial data is obscured by geomasking techniques that serve to protect the location privacy of victims. They never provide the location of where an exact crime was reported. I think there are methods called jittering, which are used to kind of um, shake the exact location. Um, so what we think might have happened outside of a school might not have actually happened there, but these are just used to protect the privacy of victims. Secondly, police recorded crime statistics are known to contribute to the grey figure of crime in that they underestimate the actual number of crimes recorded and not just reported, which reduces the accuracy of statistical models due to a large amount of missing data. This isn't something that can be overcome in like mapping techniques, but is something that definitely needs to be considered if you are using open police recorded statistics. Um, thirdly, there are some conceptual issues surrounding the definition of crime types in police recorded statistics. For example, um, the police tend to combine violent offences with sexual offences and these are grouped under one category. This should be viewed with caution in, in analysis as it applies quite an overtly like holistic definition by conceptualising these indifferent crimes into one category in that not all violent crimes are sexual and not all sexual crimes are violent. But unfortunately, there's no way to kind of distinguish between these two. Additionally, police recorded crime statistics fail to include um, demographic variables, which is why a lot of data and research that does use crime data, you need to have some knowledge about how to join this to other data, whether this is census data or administrative data that can provide more information um, and the kind of like last limitation are the impacts of seasonality. Unfortunately, with police recorded crime statistics, we are limited to monthly and yearly data, <coughs> which means that temporal, temporal analysis is only limited to monthly or yearly trends. Additionally, we have to consider effects um, or large events that kind of break everyday routines, one being the effect of COVID-19. Over the pandemic, research has identified a reduction in some criminal activity as a result of increased government restriction and lockdown rules. One example being that there was a huge reduction in burglary as more people have been forced to work from home, reducing opportunities to commit these crimes. So it's not entirely accurate to hold year to year comparisons over the pandemic. And this is something you have to consider when um, examining crime data. 
We're going to take a little break here, but I'm going to give you guys the opportunity to kind of discuss any more challenges um, that you think may arise when dealing with crime data. So if you'd like, you can head over back to um, Mentimeter and just kind of put any thoughts in that you think might arise when, when dealing with crime data, but we're going to call this a five minute break as well. Looks like we have some um, great examples that have come through. Uh, we can discuss a few of these. It, the first being that it encodes existing systemic discrimination. That is a great point and links back to kind of that grey figure of crime because why is there such a huge gap between reported and recorded statistics? Um, well, Grubber and Stern, they they did this study, I think it was in 2018, that highlighted that to call the police is, is a privilege of being white. So there's this kind of like um the the willingness to call the police is affected by demographics and affected by certain parts of the population. This, this is something just to consider because not all populations are there for likely to call the police. So reports of, of um, crime raise questions about reliability from, from different sample sizes. On that, yeah, we, we don't have, um, we, we miss the wider context, that's very true. Football seasons probably impacts the prevalence, location and timing of certain crimes quite a lot. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, we would definitely expect to kind of see more antisocial behaviour arise during football games. But these might not be noted or recorded in, in certain studies. Uh, crime data is partly a product of police activity rather than a measure of criminal activity. That's a great point. Um, I'm just having a read through these. Uh, Nadia, we also got a question in the chat. Um, oh, yeah. Alex asks, does the available crime location data include information on what proportion of recorded crimes in that area is missing for spatial data? So I think like, do, do the reports for an area, do they, do they tell you when the exact location is missing or is that just left um, as, as sort of missing values or, or you know? Not yeah, I think, I think those are left as missing values in crime data. Um, we do explore some of this in the workshop. There are a few um, missing values dealt with when we, when we group our crimes by NSOA, so we can have a look into that a little bit later on as well. Um, but I think they are just marked as missing values, yeah. Um, Difficult to detect where especially street crimes occur. That's very true. And this is because, um, again, I guess because of the geo-masking and geo-privacy issues, we can never, it's, it's, it's hard because we can never really trust um, exactly where these crimes happen. We kind of just have to, to trust that there is some accuracy involved in that. Um, Balance of data collection processes based on uneven police actions towards different districts. Very, very true. Um, I mean, in Greater Manchester, I think it was in 2019, we lost, was it six to, to eight months of data due to, due to a fault in the system? So we have this huge gap in Manchester where we have no idea what levels of crime happened. Um, Thinking the crime data with level of various depth in the areas. Yeah, that's true. Um, a lot of studies tend to link um, administrative data 
to levels of deprivation, but crime statistics in itself don't kind of include these. If you think about it, actually, crime data are really quite limited unless you are joining these other data sets, um, especially census data sets would provide a lot of benefits to studying um, deprivation levels as well as like disparities among our society. Additionally, some people might question the use of quantitative methods as, as quite insensitive to, to crime statistics, where, where some people might favour the use of like crime surveys to provide more individualistic experiences of crime. However, of course, large quantitative studies have proved effective in, in both the prediction of crime rates and the introduction slash amendment of new policy. So um, I'm just wary of the time, but these are really, really good points and definitely things that you should be considering when using open recorded police statistics. So we've just kind of finished up the presentation now on, on GIS and spatial data, and I hope we I hope I've been able to provide a uh, brief introduction to the main topics. I understand that I haven't been able to cover everything, but as I said, that would be incredibly hard to do in such a short uh, demonstration. But we're going to just have a, a 10 minute break while we allow you to prepare your R Studio space for the code demo. There is a, so if you follow the GitHub link, there is a step-by-step -step guide on how to set up your working directory and install the packages required. You can also just kind of clone over the repo from GitHub, which would then mean it'd be easier to follow along with the code that we run. The option is up to you, but we'll give you, I call it 10 minutes to, to have a break, stretch your legs, and we'll come back and get going with the code demo. So we'll see you back in 10 minutes. All right, so hopefully everyone has got their um, R Studio up and running and you can see the same scripts that, I, that you see in front of me. Um, if not, that's okay. You can just type the code as we go, but it might take you a little bit longer and I don't want anyone to fall too far behind. But yeah, this is topic one. We'll be exploring uh, our crime data, specifically how to turn non-spatial data into spatial data. These are the packages required. Um, hopefully these are all installed and loaded into your library. And we will just get started with the crime demo. We have about, uh, I think it's an hour and a half to run through these topics. So it'll be roughly 20 to 25 minutes per, per topic. So the crime data was downloaded from data.police.uk. I've selected the months August 2020 to August 2021 specifically from the area of Surrey. There is information in this uh, Word document about how to download this data if you are interested in case you, um, you want to use this in the future. But yeah, just download that data, unzip it and load that into your working directory. The folders are also available here. We will only be looking at one month of data throughout this, this workshop, but I thought I'd include a year just in case you wanted to do your own analysis. But yeah, let's first. In, let's first uh, download the data. I've just called this crime. You can call it whatever you'd like. Um, I'm also using the clean names function under the janitor package, which just helps to make all variables lowercase and just a bit neater for, for data analysis. So let's quickly just explore our, our variables. As you can see, we have the crime ID, which isn't really relevant to us. We then have the time date variable. In this instance, as I said, we only have month and years, which is why temporal analysis can be really limited. Um, year to year comparisons isn't entirely recommended when it comes to crime data. We then have where it was reported by, where it falls within. We then have our longitude, our latitude, our location, our LSO codes, LSOA names and the crime type and also the last outcome category. Um, so typically LSOOs have an average population of 1000 and they're used to improve the reporting of small area statistics in England and Wales. 
As mentioned before, LSOIs aren't that recognisable to non-statistics minds or like non-geographers. So it can be quite hard to kind of share these results to, to non-researchers. Um, but they are really useful when it comes to mapping administrative data, which is what we would be doing with, with our census data. Um, you can also look at the different features of spatial data in this example. Our point data is represented by our longitude and latitude. Our location variable represents the line, and this is normally defined by like a street or junction. And as you can see, we have on a street, St. George's Court. And then we have the LSO name, which kind of represents our polygon. Um, you can also use borough, wards, districts, but in this instance, we are using LSOs. Um, so let's just briefly explore our data set. Currently, this is a, a non-spatial data set. Even though that we have long, uh, longitude and latitude variables, R doesn't know that this is a spatial data set. So currently, this is, this is still non-spatial, but we're going to explore the data set as if it was non-spatial at first by using the functions ggmap and ggplot. ggmap likes to build its plot in a function called qmplot, which is the ggplot equivalent of qplot. The basic idea driving ggmap is to take a downloaded map image, plot it as a context layer using ggplot, and then plot additional content layers of data, statistics, or models on top of the map. In uh, ggmap, downloading map as an image and formatting the image of, for plotting is done with the getMap function. It's kind of considered like a, like a wrapper um, a wrapper function. Arguably, qmaps is, not, is like known as the quicker function, but it's less accurate for plotting spatial data. Um, it's pretty much just useful to build maps that are similar to ones we see via our app, such as like Google Maps. Um, so first, let's just get an overview of our crimes on my map using QMplot. What we first do is call the longitude and latitude variables, call on our data set. And in this instance, we are coloring our crime type. We also set some aesthetic features. So if we run this QMplot code, we'll see quite a basic image of our point data in, sorry, scroll down and we have this Arguably not the neatest kind of map, but we can see the different types of crime types that are available in our area of Surrey. You then might be interested in, to, in um, to studying like one specific area. In this example, I'm specifically looking at Crawley002B. This is just a random area from the crime data set. In order to get a um, the like location like um, information of a variable of an area, sorry, you can use the geocode function. Geocode simply identifies the longitude and latitude of an area. It is the process of determining geographic coordinates for place names, street addresses, and codes. It uses uh, Google's like geocoding API to turn addresses from text to latitude and longitude and then pairs them quite nicely. So if we run this geocode function on our area of Crawley 002B, we get our longitude and latitude variables. We could then use the getMap function to specifically uh, plot our area of Crawley. And what we have to do is create a new object that uh, defines the longitude and latitude for the areas, which I've done in line 83. But you might be wondering why the longitude and latitudes I have provided are different to the longitude and latitudes provided from the geocode function. And this is because of our geomasking and geo privacy issues. We see that the coordinates have been shifted just a little bit, so they're different to what um, Google's API has picked up. So these are, again, just like the issues you really need to consider when looking at spatial data. Nevertheless, we're going to just uh, use this as an example. So we create a new object called Crawley and identify longitude and latitude. We then use the getMap function and set this to a zoom of 13. Um, and that will kind of just load up. Sorry, I should open the console a little bit. And then we can plot this map using ggmaps with the new object map that we have just created. 
So if we run ggbap on the new object, we now have kind of an aerial image of our area of Crawley 002B. Obviously, this is not providing any information about our crime data set. This is simply just an aerial image of, of Crawley. In order to include the point data from our crime, set, crime data set, we can use the geom uh, underscore point function to call specific points from our crime data set. And I've done this just here. So again, we use ggmaps, call in our map that we've created. We then use the geom underscore point and address the aesthetics, which are our longitude and latitude variables. And we then call on the data set. So if we run this, we'll have the same in image we've just seen, but with point data represented in Crawley. We can also... Um, Nadia, yes, can sir? I just interrupt you? A lot of people following along are having trouble with um, getting the API key. They're trying to run the code and it says error. Google now requires an API key. Oh, okay. Uh, that is something I didn't mention, apologies. Yes, you would need to set a uh, API key. I completely forgot to mention that. That's because I already had mine set from last year. Um, I think you can just do this via... Uh, I'm just thinking about where to do this. Apologies. Yeah, no, it's fine. I mean, there's also some people who are having trouble um, getting the files off of Git. So um, I, don't, oh, no, I don't know if we want to just take a quick break to let people sort of down install yeah. all these functions and try and get the files off of Git. And oh, um, Yes, I didn't realize I was running too fast. Um, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> just pause here um, and I'll have a look at the Google API right now, see if I can find some resources. If you hold on a moment, I'll just um, say something about how to download the files in um, Git. No um, when people go to the GitHub uh, repo, and I'm just sharing the link again so that people can um, can follow. If you go directly to that page, there's a big green button that says code and has a open sm smaller menu arrow. If you click on that big green button, it gives you the option to clone and that's using Git. Um, open with GitHub Desktop, but you have to have GitHub Desktop installed or download zip. Download zip will give you all of the files from this repo in a local drive on your computer, at which point you can unzip it and use those files within R in a way that you normally would. So hopefully that helps everyone get the files from GitHub if they were struggling with that. Uh, if anyone else has questions about this still, please do let me know. Um, so yeah, this is the, the GitHub link from, from the web. An easy way to kind of copy this whole repo is to click the green code button. You can simply just copy the, the HTTP address. And if we head back over to our R studios, I'm gonna to have to stop sharing, sorry. Um, head back over to R studios. You can click file, new project. You can click uh, version control. Click the Git where you can clone your project from the Git repo. And you can just simply post the URL in there. This will automatically copy the name. Uh, you can save this in a new, in a, in a folder in your computer, anywhere you'd like. And I typically suggest opening in a new session so you don't have any clashes. And then this will automatically just open up what you, what I see in my screen. And this is just quite an easy way to go ahead and do that. Okay. Super. That's really good. Hopefully that's also given people a bit of time to um, get all of the install packages and sort of get libraries and things yes, like that yeah. up and running. So great. Thank you so much. It can take a while to install packages. So yeah, I can. Don't blame the confusion. Um, hopefully everyone is a little bit more on track, but we're going to 
continue with the workshop but if you have any issues still please just let us know in the chat and one of us will, will help you out so we're going to skip over the gg maths because that was completely my fault for not uh, remembering the api key but as i said this isn't the best method to go ahead and plot maps anyway so so don't worry about it um, so yeah, we're going to move on to looking at simple features and projection methods. A simple feature is a data frame that contains a collection of spatial objects. Each row is a spatial object that may have data associated uh, with it. Simple features is compatible with ggplot. And there is another older package named SP, but within the last few years, researchers and geographers are moving from SP to SF. The only main difference you need to know between SP um, and SF is that basically SP package didn't really work entirely with all of our data frame structures, hence the use of SF is, is much more uh, beneficial. To recap, when working with spatial data, you need to identify a CRS in order to move from that 3D image to uh, the 2D. SF objects are, as I said, data frames that contain a collection of spatial objects. Um, <clears throat> there are thousands of coordinate reference systems. And typically, when you are working with the longitude and latitude variables, which is what we have in our case, um, you would use what we call the World Geodetic System, which is on line 122. With each coordinate reference system, you have to identify a unique ESPG, which I think stands for European Petroleum Survey Group. I might have, might have made that up, but um, each code is just a four to five digit number, which represents a particular CRS definition. So when do you use the CRS? Well, first it's worth considering when to transform the data. In some cases, transforming to a projected CRS is essential, such as when using like geometric functions, such as um, uh, like SD underscore buffer, which just allows you to subset really small data points. But yeah, if your data contains longitude and latitude, as I said, then the world geodetic system is the one we would use. However, if your data contains uh, northings and easterns, then you would use uh, the projected coordinate systems. An example of the projected coordinate systems would be the British National Grid. But we don't need to worry about that now. So in order to check what CRS um, you have, you can use the st underscore CRS function. So we'll run this on our crime data set, and you'll see that we have NA and that we do not have a coordinate reference system attached to our crime data set. So in order to attach uh, a CRS, we can use the ST underscore AS to SF function, which turns our crime data set into a special features. Uh, the first thing you need to do is call on the data set and then you use the cause functions to call on the longitude and latitude. You then call on the CRS, and in this instance, the unique identifier is 4326 for the World Geodetic System. You can also um, exclude or include NAs if you'd like, but that's not a necessary part of the code. So if we run this, um, I'm creating a new object called SF just to make things a little bit clearer between our original crime data set and our newly created uh, simple features object. So we run this, and now we have a new object in our data set. And you can see that we have one less variable. Um, the first thing to always do is to check that the CRS has matched and has worked. So again, we can use the ST underscore CRS function to do so. And now, as you can see, now we have an attached coordinate reference system. In this instance, the World Geodetic System. So let's have a brief look at our data set and see why we have one less variable. If we just uh, use the head function, you can check all the variables that are on your data set. So we'll scroll right to the end, and we'll see a new column called geometry. You may also notice that the longitude and latitude columns have disappeared. This is because the longitude and latitudes have almost joined now, and 
have turned into a geometry attribute that make up one variable. This is the main difference between spatial and non-spatial objects. So let's go ahead and map our point data with our newly found uh, SF object, which contains the point levels. In order to plot the point data, we can use ggplot, and we can use the additional function geomsf, which is in line 161. GeomSF is quite similar to functions such as um, hist or box plots under ggplot, but GeomSF specifically works for spatial data. It's a unique aesthetic which basically expects to find a special features column containing the simple features data. Um, this is our newly created variable that we had. So if we run this, the first, the first ggplot, we can see we have a, um, a plot of our crime data in Surrey. We have the longitude and we have the latitude and we have the points. Um, obviously, this map doesn't really tell us much. We don't have a base map or a reference map attached, so it's really hard to know where this is. And additionally, we have yet to um, specify different crime types. So we can go ahead and do that by kind of addressing the different aesthetics that the ggplot function has. So let's start by first colouring the different crime types. We can do this by applying an additional part to the code. We again call on ggplot, we then call on the geomsf function, we then call the data set, and then we use AES, which is the aesthetics function, to uh, call the crime type by colour. So if we run this, you will see a, hopefully, there we go. You see a map that identifies the crime type by color. Although this is better than the first map, this still doesn't really tell us much because we have no idea where this is, right? This, this, could, be, this could be anywhere. So why don't we go ahead and attach the uh, reference map, which will help to identify those physical features of, of our area. And to attach a reference map, you would use the function called annotation map tile seen in line 169. Um, you don't need to call any other additional features inside the brackets. So just simply add this code, run the code, and you'll see it might take a little longer just because we are using a reference map. And then we have a new map that uh, is plotted over our area of Surrey, as well as addressing the different crime types. Although this is better than, than our first map we created, it is still quite messy and we still have quite an overlay of, of, uh, of um, crime types in certain areas, which makes it really hard to read this map. One kind of method to, to overcome this is to or look specifically at certain crime types. So we can do this by subsetting the data set and selecting only one, one crime type. So let's just go ahead and do that. In this instance, I am subsetting for the crime type antisocial behavior. You can, um, yeah, you can follow along or you can use a different crime type, that's totally up to you. In this instance, I create a new object called ASB uh, we subset our simple features object. We um, call on the variable crime type and use a double equal sign to address which crime type we want to look at. I've also just um, removed some columns here because they weren't of interest to me. They're not necessary to use. So if we do that, we now have a new data set that just contains our antisocial behavior crime. And then we can use the same a ggplot code to plot the same type of map. In this instance, we obviously won't need to call on the on the aesthetics call because we are only looking at one crime type. But I still want to include a reference map. So let's just go ahead and plot the ggplot for our antisocial behaviour. Perfect. Um, now we have a 
map of antisocial behaviour just in Surrey. Um, this code should belong there, apologies. I realise that we might have gone through quite a lot in this topic, so we're definitely going to call on a, a 10 minute break here where I'll give you an opportunity just to make sure that everything is running smoothly in that section. There is also a chance to run a little activity, as you can see at the end of the script. So if you have a moment um, in, in this break, go ahead and have a go at subsetting this for just the crime type drugs and then creating your own GG plot maps. I've used partial codes in this instance just to, to make this run a bit smoother, but we'll give you five to 10 minutes to have a go at filling out this activities and then we'll ask any questions that you may have. I um, definitely don't want to rush anyone here, but if anyone has happened just to uh, finish the activity, what I might suggest to you is that having a look at different CRS uh, identifiers back in our, where we use the STF underscore function, you can have a look at what would happen if you change the CRS to something like the British National Grid. If you change the identifier to 27700, and create a plot, you'll see what kind of effect um, this has on your data. And uh, yeah, you'll be able to see that we, we don't have our longitude and latitudes presented. And this is because longitudes and latitudes work well, the world geodetic system. Um, I can run this after the activity if people would like to see the example from, from myself, but uh, yeah. All right, um, it's been about five minutes, so I'm going to go ahead and answer these activity questions at the bottom. Um, feel free to stop me at any point if you have any questions. Um, yeah, let's get going. So the first step was to subset the data for those crimes, uh, crime types recorded as drugs. So the first thing you would do is call on your variable, oops, but all right, call on your variable crime type and select your um, select your prime type. In this is instance, we are interested in drugs. From what I remember, it's like it's a capital D, but we'll find out and we'll see if that's right. So we subset this data set, um, you realize we get the data set in, in this code here. In order to create this into its own object, all you would have to do is use the assignment operator and replicate this code app. So we we'll just do that again, replicate the code, insert your prime type, which is drugs, which is capital D. Uh, remember R is case sensitive. So if you use a lowercase d, then this, you would get a, um, you get an empty, you get an empty data frame. So we run this and then we have 217 observations of, of our crime type drugs. So step three was to uh, use ggplot to plot the point data over a base map. So let's do this. To create the base map, we use the function annotation map tile, which is here. Again, you don't need to include any information in the parentheses and you call on your new data set, which in this instance is called plot. If we run this ggplot, um, just give it a minute. We now have a map of drugs in Surrey, and you can see that this is much less than the antisocial behaviour map. Um, just a little side note, if you'd like to present these maps side by side, you could use a, a function called plot underscore grid, which is in the package how plot, which I Excuse 
sorry, yeah, um, which is in the package Calplot. So just install this library if you haven't got it installed already. Remember to use quotation marks when installing packages. You can load Calplot into your data frames and then the function used to plot these grids side by side would look like this. So you call on plot underscore grid, then call on the data frames that, I mean, the maps that you want to plot side by side. In this instance, we're interested in um, our drugs and our antisocial behaviour. But before doing that, you need to make sure that these GD plots have been assigned to their own objects. So what you need to do is call this uh, drug underscore map, for example, and assign that to a ggplot. So this doesn't plot the map, this just creates an object. Uh, if you scroll up, you then have to do the same for your, uh, your antisocial map, antisocial behavior map, which is here. So again, we call on a new object called ASB map. Use assignment operator and assign the ggplot function to our ASB map. As you can see, these have been added to our data frames, but uh, to our environment, but they're not data frames, they are lists. And then to plot these side by side, you simply call on the data set. So we've called these ASB map, uh, drug map, and this should be able to plot the maps side by side. This is just a nice little um, function to kind of like make the work a bit neater, you know? Hopefully this will load. And there we are. Now we have both maps side by side and you can see huge differences in the, in the amount of antisocial behavior compared to drugs. You can also add um, other features if you like. You can, you can title these by using the labels function. And then you would call these ASB, I guess. Might just make things a little bit clearer for you. This is the issue with plotting uh, maps, of uh, making maps, everything takes so long. And then we have uh, two maps with very boring titles, but these in help to identify the differences between ASB and drugs. So hopefully you've been able to, to run that activity yourself. This topic has highlighted how we can plot point level data using simple features objects. We've also looked at how to um, turn non-spatial data sets into spatial data sets. Um, and I mentioned that you might want to have a go at using a different coordinate reference system to see what would happen. I'll just quickly show this. If we change the coordinate reference system to Let's use the British National Grid, which is 27700. I'm going to call this SF2 because I don't want to get rid of my original object. So now we have a new simple features object called SF2 with the coordinate reference system um, 27700. We can check the reference system again by using this function. And you can see we have assigned this to the British National Grid. So what would happen if we plot this data set then? We'll go back to our very, very uh, simple, simple map of our point data. Remember to change the object to the SF2 that we've just created. And if we plot this, we'll see quite a um, messy map. We don't have any coordinates like we did before which tells us that we're in the wrong coordinate reference system. So this is just how you can kind of tell um, which coordinate reference system would work for your data set. Uh, yeah, that's topic one. I'm going to change this back just so we don't have any confusion. Um, I might even just move object to because we're not using the British National Grid anyway. So if anyone's got any questions, please ask away. Otherwise, I'm going to give it a few minutes and move on to topic two. We did have one question from Paul, who says the base map created by annotation underscore map underscore tile is quite blurry. 
Is there a way to make that clearer? Um, that's a very good question. There probably is, but I don't have the answer to it. Uh, okay, that's, <laughs> that's fine. I mean, it's one of I'll those honest, things we yeah. can we can try and look up an answer, you know, at some point in the future. But <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure there is. I bet you could either change the like, um, I don't know, the, the opacity of it maybe, or yeah, I'll have a look if we have some time at the end. How about that? Yeah. All right, so if everyone is happy, we can move on to topic two. All right then, so yeah, we'll move on to topic two. Again, make sure these packages are loaded into a library and we'll get started on uh, our shapefiles. So what is a shapefile? A shapefile is a common format in the GIS industry. It stores our vector data, that is our points, lines and polygons, and it stores it as a single feature class, which means it will only store a single type in that it will only store point data, it will only store line data, or it will only store uh, polygon data. Um, they represent, yeah, the, excuse me, sorry. They contain multiple files and they're usable across multiple applications within GIS. If you, <coughs> If you open the shapefile data set here on the bottom right in our, in our files tab, you'll see that there are multiple files that are attached to our, um, to our shapefile. We have the .dbf file, which is, um, it, it contains the attribute for each shape. You have the .prg file, which is just a file that contains information on projection format including the coordinate reference system and projection information. Uh, you then have the .shx file, which contains the positional index of the feature geometry. And then you have the .shp file, which contains the geometry grade data. And um, this file contains the geometry for all the features. Now, this is the file we'll be using to, this is the shape file that we will be using. To read in a shapefile, you use the st underscore read function within the SF package. So if we run this file in, we have this, uh, this information here that is provided. And it's telling us that we're dealing with a multi-polygon. A multi-polygon is the same as a polygon. This just means that we are looking at multiple polygons, um, which are would be like multiple LSOAs. That's that's all that means. Um, <clears throat> to plot the shape file, you can again use the ggplot function like we did earlier with the geom underscore sf function. So if we run this, we'll see a very very like basic image of our shape file. And what we see here is our shape file of Surrey with each LSOO. These um, are boundary districts of each LSOO, as this is what I selected when using the um, open boundary data from the UK data service. Again, I've provided information on how to download this data set uh, because it can be quite difficult to select what kind of um, level of like administrative ward you want, but yeah, all information available in the files. <coughs> Um, if we view this file, we'll see we have our LSO names, our LSO codes, and again, our geometry, which identifies that this is a shape file because we have combined longitude and latitude in one column. So let's um, move on to, oh yeah, you can use the ST geometry function kind of just to have a look at other features of the data set. Um, it's pretty similar to, to reading it in, so not that necessary to know. But again, it's just telling you that's a polygon and it lists the first five geometries in, in, in our area. So let's move on to grouping the crimes per LSOO. The original crime data set contains the individual count of repeated crime types across LSOOs. 
LSOA, sorry. <laughs> Therefore, the LSOAs are repeated multiple times. This is because you would expect to see like multiple crime counts in one LSOA. So in order to highlight how many crimes have occurred in each area, we can count the crimes per LSOA and obtain group statistics. So this function here is quite a neat way just to do this all in one. What I'm doing is creating a new object called crimes grouped by LSOA. Arguably, this isn't the, the most effective name for an object, but this was just to, to make this code a bit clearer. We then call on our original crime data set, and we group these by the LSOO code. And then we summarize by the count. So if we run this code, we'll see a new data set here. And you see that we have much less um, observations than the original crime data set. And this is telling us um, the crimes per LSOO. So we can again just use that head function to, to have a look at what we're dealing with. And as you can see, each LSOO is listed on the left. And within each LSOO, we have the crime count that has happened within that area. Bear in mind that this is the um, total crime type. We're not looking at a specific crime type at the moment. So now we have a separate data frame that contains our grouped crime statistics. We need a way to join this to our shape files. We can do this by um, using a function called left underscore join. And this function returns all the rows of the table on the left side of the join and matches the rows for the table on the right side of the join. In layman's terms, all this is doing is matching the LSOO code from the shapefile, which is identified by this variable, and the LSOO code in the crimes group by LSOO dataset to this variable. So if we run this code, I've also called this a new object called, uh, sorry, LSOO, LSOA, I keep saying that wrong. <laughs> um, and now we have a new object called Surrey LSOA. So let's just have a quick look at how our data set looks. Oh, so what we have is a simple features object with each LSOA, LSOA um, and the crime count that has happened within. We can view the geometry type by looking at the ST geometry type function. And it, this again is telling us that this is a multi polygon. And this is because we have, this is because like each LSOA is a polygon and we're dealing with 725 at this point. Uh, we can also then use the underscore ST underscore BB box function to obtain um, the object's values as like specific units. So I think these are. I think these might be like the average um, X and Y parameters for the longitude and latitudes. Uh, we can then go ahead and plot this data using our ggplot again, similar to what we did before. We attach an annotation map tile, which provides the base map. We then call on the geom sf function using our newly found, a newly created data set, sorry, underscore LSOA. And we fill this by the crime count. This is our new variable that we created. And I'm also just setting the opacity to 0 0.05 so it's a bit clearer. So if we run this ggplot function, just close it off a bit. This is the issue. There we are. Now we have a thematic map that highlights the number of crimes per LSOA. And you can see that uh, on the west side of Surrey, we seem to have higher numbers of crimes, which is quite interesting. Um, we can also use a package called Tmaps to plot, plot this Surrey LSOA. Um, data as well. It's got a pretty similar function to, to ggplots and SF, um, and the code's really easy to use. 
There are two modes that you can use with the TMATCH package, which is pretty cool. One is an interactive map and one is more of like a, um, like this kind of map. Very, very basic. So we wouldn't have that interactive element. And to do this, we can use the view slash plot function. The view function identifies an interactive map and a plot function identifies what we see like here. Um, so the first thing you always need to do with TMAPs is set the type of mode you want. In this instance, I'm just gonna plot, I'm gonna set the, the mode to plot, and then we'll have a look at um, what would happen if we change this to view. Then you need to identify, uh, use the TM shape function to identify your shape file or your, your polygon or your line or point data. This is where you would identify that. Use the TM underscore fill, which would fill in our variable of interest, which is the crime count. And then we can use some aesthetics to um, identify the borders between our NSRAs. I'm just gonna call these, make these green so it's a little bit clearer. And again, these just set the, the thickness and the opacity. So if we run this code under the, the plot mode of TMAPs, we'll have this map here. It's pretty similar to the ggmaps plot, but people have different preferences on, about which package they like to use. Both do very similar things, so it's, it's up to you. Um, let's have a look at what would happen if we use the view function. All you'd have to do is change, change the mode to, to view, and you'll get this warning, which is, which is fine, this is expected. And then you just run the same type of map, the same code. Might take a little bit longer because we are using an interactive map, but yeah. Now you have an interactive map of your crime count in Surrey LSOA, LSOA. <laughs> and you can select each area if you want to have a look at that in detail. You can zoom in, you can zoom out. Um, some people prefer this map, some people prefer the, the plot mode, but it kind of really just does depend what, what you're using this map for, you know. Um, I'm just going to take a two minute break while I go and get a drink, but we're going to go move on to classification methods next. Um, all right, I'm back, I'm hydrated and I'm ready to go. So we're going to move on to looking at classification methods now. And this kind of helps in order to, to better visualize count data. Count data does not equally represent the population distribution at hand, but the TMAPS package allows you to alter the characteristics of these thematic maps via the styles function. Um, when mapping quantitative data, such as crime counts, Typically, the variables need to, put in, need to be put into bins. As seen in the previous example, the default binning applied to the, um, to the LSOO's group started from, I think it was 1 to 10, 11 to 20, 21 to 30, 31 to 40, 41 to 50, and then finally 51 to 60. And these bins are decided automatically, but we can define more accurate classes that best reflect the distributional character of the data set. There are multiple different classification methods that you can use and different systems you can use. In this example, I specifically look at the k-means, the jenks, and the standard deviation. Um, the k-means is kind of a method of like vector quantization that aims to form a partition of like n observations in the k clusters in which each observation belongs to the cluster with the nearest mean. Um, Jenks, also known as natural breaks or the goodness of fit variance, aims to arrange a set of values into natural classes. And then the standard deviation method is a standardized measure, measure of observations derived from the mean. There, I know there's quite a lot of statistics involved in these, in these methods. Um, I've given a very, very basic rundown of these, but if you are um, interested, then you can use the help function to kind of get a better idea of the statistics. 
and how these change the shape of your data. But let's just have a quick look at um, how these make our data, how, they, how these make our maps look different. So start off by the k-means. All we have done is um, use the same code as above as the t-maps, but the only difference is we have identified the style function and use quotation marks to identify the different type of classification methods. In our first one, we're looking at k-means. So I'll have a quick plot of this. Oh. And as you can see, our bins are much different to what were in the, um, in the original, just like count data in the, in the automatic one. The, arguably there are more counts in the, in, the, in the east of Surrey, but it's hard to say. We can then also run same thing with Jenks. I'm just kind of highlighting the differences between how the bins change here. Again, you can see the bins change here. Um, we're up to 53 at, at our max, whereas with automatic, we was up to 50, it was up to 60 actually, which tells us that um, the automated classification system might be over predicting some of these crimes in areas. And let's have a quick look at standard deviation. Again, very different um, classification systems. In this instance, we even have minus. Uh, that's because this is standard deviation. But you can just see how each classification system changes the way you interpret a map. And that's why it's really important to, to consider using these different types of methods and not just to stick with the automated system. Um, one way you can um, kind of map these together, similar to how we did it with the cow plot, is to assign each map to an object. So let's assign each map to its own object, and we're just going to call these A, B, and C. First one's called A. That is our K means. Our gents map is going to be called B. And then our standard deviation is going to be called C. And we can plot these together by using the T map arrange function, obviously under, underneath the T map map package. And all you'd have to do is identify those three new objects that we have just created. So we have A, B, and C. This might take a while, hopefully not. But um, yeah, it probably will. We'll just give this a minute while, while this loads up. Ah, that's a good example. The reason this has happened is because we are currently in the um, interactive viewing mode. Remember how we use the tmap mode function? This needs to be set to plot in order to use the tmap arrange. Um, so we set this back to plot and then rerun these maps so that they're run in the plot function. Let's just run these again. And now we should be able to plot these three maps using, um, using the, the, the mode plot. There we go, that's much better. Now we have our three maps side by side. Um, you can see differences in, in the maximum and minimum crime count and how these varies across LSOAs. So just really keep this in mind when you are looking at your um, when you're looking at your own data and what perceptions these might have on your viewers. Um, you can also identify um, categorical variables in your data set. Just like the tmaps arrange function, the tmap facets are a way to produce like side-by-side -side maps, also known as small multiples. It's very similar to the facet grid function in ggplot if you've ever used that. I put some information here if you want to read more about small multiples. But in this instance, we are um, using the TM facets just to plot these maps per LSO, which arguably isn't ideal. But because we haven't got a clear categorical variable, we're just using this for now. But if you had something like deprivation or, um, or gender or, or um, 
household income. This might be a better representation for categorical variables. But I just wanted to provide an example of how you would do this using TM facets. So if we run this, our name variable, by the way, just refers to the name of each LSOA. But as you can see, it plots these really small multiples with each, each area in our area of interest. Probably not the easiest plot to read because we are using LSO names. But as I said, this is just an example in case you had other categorical variables in your data set that you're interested in showing. Um, I realize we are pushed for time, so I'm going to skip over the additional features of T maps, but uh, feel free to, to go through this yourself at the end. So, activity two. I'm going to give you guys, I think, I think 10 minutes should be enough to kind of go through these activities and um, also an opportunity to ask any questions that you have. So please feel free to leave a message in the chat. Um, but in this example, in this activity, sorry, I've kind of just given the option to explore different classification systems and how they can vary and what the main difference is. Um, so yeah, just, just have a go at these activities and then we'll run through them in, in 10 minutes. I just want to pipe up and say that the K-means um, clustering option that you showed earlier mm -hmm. counts as machine learning. So if you want to impress your friends at holiday parties, tell them <laughs> how you used machine learning to you know, map crime data. Mm. That is very good to me. I didn't know that myself. Just wanted to mention another uh, comment that came up in the chat that I think is probably useful for everyone to know about is that um, you are allowed to publish, to create maps and share them with people and publish them freely if you're using open source data. Mm -hmm. If you're using securely obtained data, data that is that is given to you under, you know, certain conditions or that you have to apply for access to get it through secure means, you are still allowed to create all the maps that you want and as part of your analysis, but that if you do want to share or publish those maps, you need to be very careful to make sure that they don't disclose anything inappropriate, that they are um, meet the conditions under which you have access to the data. So um, just want to let people know that because there are you know, issues around uh, privacy and security when using mapping um, sort of analysis styles, you're, you're still allowed to, to map um, securely obtained data, but that you should take care when sharing or publishing it. Uh, we have a comment in the chat. Uh, Alex asks, says uh, ST underscore CRS uh, parentheses SF error uh, object SF not found. I'm guessing that just means the package hasn't been installed properly. But um, Nadia, if you have any other useful insight on that. Um, yeah, that might just be because you haven't installed the package or you haven't created that SF object yet. Um, ah. If yeah, fair enough. One, just reload that function that creates the SF object, and then you should be able to run that function. Yeah, maybe just back up a couple of steps and, and rerun the code. Yeah. yeah. It was just in topic one. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, there were some problems people had following along in topic one. So if we missed, if you missed out a step in, in topic one, that topic two then refers to, that could, that could give you an error like that. Yeah, definitely. And I understand that we've created a lot of objects. Um, typically, this isn't recommended. It's to, you might just want to like override each object, but for, for clarity purposes, it, it's just easier to see the steps that we've made um, in this workshop. Yeah, this is um, sort of a matter of style once you get used to working in R. I quite like to create lots of different objects, um, but I'm generally working in a directory that isn't sort of limited for space or, mm -hmm. or speed or something like that. If you're working on a machine that struggles with a lot of different objects or you're working in a space where, where you know, too many 
very large objects is going to cause a problem, then you might want to overwrite. Definitely, yeah. And when it comes to um, mapping data, you'll realize that R does struggle a little bit, especially if you have large data sets. So um, overriding might might be the better option with, with mapping, but I tend to prefer creating loads of little objects as well, because it almost keeps track of what, what you're doing, doesn't it? It does, yeah. I feel like there's a lot of, um, it, it's sort of a way of showing your work, um, mm -hmm. which is quite useful for yourself if you get mixed up and decide to go back and redo something at an earlier stage. You can kind of see, oh, what have I done? Um, exactly. But yeah, uh, maps are quite large uh, and large data sets create very large maps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's easy enough to, to delete an object. It's just the, the RM function. So if you do find that there are too many objects in your way, you can just use this function to, to delete some of those in your environment. Okay. Um, just a quick follow-up question to the um, object not found uh, question was, could you perhaps show us which line of code creates the SF object oh, or, or maybe mention it just sort of like? It would be line 134 from topic one. Um, 134 from topic one in R simple features. Okay, that's great. Yeah, in this chunk here where we identify the coordinate reference system. That one there. Okay, yep. I've just popped that into the code so that it's easier to uh, to reference. Okay, thanks so much. Sure. Um, yeah, I think we'll go ahead and answer these activity questions. Hopefully everyone's had enough time to kind of explore the different type of classification methods. Um, so let's let's get going. So the first question was to create two different maps for the B-class and H-class classification systems. The, from what I remember, the H-class is a form of hierarchical clustering and the B-class is a form of bag clustering. I'm not totally sure what these do. I, I'm not a statistician at heart, but we can explore these maps visually to see the differences. So the first instance is to identify your object. We're using the Surrey LSR. And here you need to identify your variable of interest, which is the count data. And then we use the style function to identify the different classification systems. In this instance, I'll use the B class. So we'll run that, make sure that works. All good, computing the hierarchical clustering is happening. And then we'll do the same for the H class. So you apply. Your data set, you then um, address the variable of interest, and then again, call on your classification system. Just to let you know, if you didn't use quotation marks, these wouldn't work. So just, oh, an extra just make sure that you always use quotation marks when calling on classification systems. And great, so these two maps have worked. Um, we can see the maps here at the bottom. And topic two, I asked to create these into separate objects and then use the tmap arrange. And we call these H. Oh. H and E. So we run these. I probably shouldn't have called it B because we already had an object called B. This is where things can get complicated, but um it would be all right for now. And then we use the tmap arrange function to plot these maps side by side. So if you do so, you should receive, just loading away, this image here, which is great. So now we have hierarchical clustering and the bag clustering side by side. Arguably there aren't that, um, not huge differences with, with what we see here, but there are definitely darker areas in the north of Surrey when we're using the bag clustering than when using the hierarchical clustering. <clears throat> and for activity three, I got an interactive map using the B class classification system. Again, this was just to explore the effects of like the different modes. 
So to plot an interactive plot, you use the view function. So we change that to view, and you know it's worked when you have this, this sign. And again, we're using the B class. You can just copy and paste the code from above, but I always think it's useful to, to type out the code as much as possible because um, well, ggplot and mapping in data is quite repetitive in a way, so it never hurts to, to keep, keep practicing these. And now we have interactive map of our Surrey area using the bag clustering. Um, if you have any questions about those activities, again, please leave them in the chat. Otherwise, I'm going to move on to topic three because I am aware of the time. Interactive maps are very cool, though. So thank you for showing us how to make that. Of course, yeah. Um, any additional activities, RMD mod file, which is somewhere in here. <laughs> well, <laughs> we'll highlight that at the end. We'll move there. To it is, the... yeah. Additional topics. All right. So hopefully everyone's on track, and um, we'll start with our topic three, looking at the differences between crime rate and crime count. So as discussed before, count data is not entirely accurate of population density. So whilst the like above maps might help us identify interesting patterns, point level open crime data is rarely used in isolation for detailed analysis. For one thing, the data points, as I said, are geomorphs. This means that the points are highly linked, likely to be overlapped giving a skewed picture of like the distribution. There are ways around this, such as through jittering or applying census-based data. In this workshop, we'll look at the latter and apply some census-based data. Um, so yeah, I think it's useful to just kind of discuss what is crime rate. In short, crime rate is best, in under is best understood in uh, totality as like, crimes per 1,000 residents per the latest census. So using rate is a way to reduce statistical bias and reduce the effect of the um, modifiable aerial unit problem, which is a big issue in uh, GIS and, and data science. So in this instance, we're looking at um, population statistics obtained from Infuse. Here is a lot of there's a lot of code going on, but this is just some data manipulation and nothing that you, it's too complicated. The slice function, we're just removing um, rows that are not of interest, Select, selecting our rows, cleaning the names, and then we are renaming our um, workday residential population and our, um, sorry, our workday population and our residential population because these are the two population types I have obtained from the Infuse. There are multiple variables that you can use from Infuse. These are just two that are easy enough to work with and provide quite a good example about the differences of using um, workday slash residential yeah, like distribution. Um, so it's known that like crime rates vary and in some populations and in some periods, the prevalence of crime is much greater than in other populations and at other times. So accounting for these findings is an enormous, like an, it's a really important task because if we understand the causal processes that underlie variation, then we might be in a position to enact um, like policy change that can bring about changes in the volume of crime in society at give, any given point in time. So the residential and the workday population are one way to do this. The residential population reflects the usual activity of an area, whereas the workday population reflects people who work, those who are residents in the area, and those that either work from home or who do not work. So let's load this data set in, and we'll have a quick look at what we're dealing with. As you can see, we have our LSO codes, our labels, and we have um, two different population types work day and the residential. We also have the population density, but we won't be using that today. So the first step is to join your population data set to our new shapefile. This is the shapefile that we created in topic two. So just make sure you have that um, made already. 
Um, we use the same left underscore join function to do this. And what we are doing is matching the LSOO code from Surrey LSOO to our population um, LSOO codes, LSOAs. Keep saying them wrong. <laughs> so yeah, we just use that left join function to kind of merge the two data sets so that we have everything under one data set. If we run that code, um, you can see that I've also kept the name as kept the name the same, um, just because. Well, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I wanted to. You can change it if you'd like, but it might get it might make things confusing. And now you'll see that our workday count and our residential count has been added to our simple features object, which is which is pretty cool which means that we'd be able to work out the crime rate. So a crime rate is calculated by dividing the total number of reported crimes by the total population and then multiplying by 100,000. So for our data set, we take the count variable, we divide this by one of the population variables, whether that's the workday or the residential, and then we times by 1,000. In this instance, we use 1000 as this is the average population of an LSOA. But if you're using a larger unit of analysis, then you might choose to multiply by 100,000. Just remember what effects will have on your rate and how this then interprets and your results. So here we use the mutate, func mutate function to create a new variable called crime rate. So we take our count data set, we divide this by the population count from the workday and we times by 1,000. And this adds this crime rate into our newly, into our simple features object. So we run this. Again, we use the head function just to see what has happened. And you can see we have a new column called crime rate um, added to our simple features, which means that now we'll be able to use the previous skills from topic two and topic one to plot these trends and see the differences between crime rate and crime count. So let's start with the ggplot. The first step is to, again, call on your base map, identify the aesthetic geom underscore sf, call on your data set, um, and fill this with the crime rate instead of the count. Before we were using the variable count, but yeah, just make sure you've changed that. If we run this, we'll see this plot's exactly kind of what we made in topic two. Um, but instead, we have the crime rate. Um, we can do, we can see that obviously there is um, a, lower, a lower proportion compared to our count. I think we're dealing with, again, 60, 60 as our maximum crime count, but here we have 30. So there are huge differences in how crime counts tend to over predict areas. So just, just bear that in mind. We can then do the same thing with our T maps. Again, instead of filling with the crime count, we're filling with our crime rate. So you can just run that the same. Um, I'm using the quantile classification system here, which I didn't, did I introduce before? No, I did not introduce before, but this is just another um, classification system that you're welcome to use. And yeah, that plot's a pretty nice a nice map. Um, crime rate is much more uh, effective than, than crime count, so definitely consider that when you're mapping your own data. But let's move on to cartograms. A cartogram is a map in which the geometry of regions is distorted in order to convey the information of an alternate variable. The region area will be inflated or deflated according to its numeric value. And in R, the cartogram package is the best way to build this. Um, a cartogram is like a type of map where different geographic areas are modified based on variables associated to those areas. So while cartograms can be like visually appealing, they require previous knowledge, fortunately, which we have already discussed. Um, so in order to create this cartogram, you first need to um, apply a weight data set, a weight variable to your population count. 
In this instance, we're going to be looking at the workday population. So uh, make sure you have and installed the Cartogram function. I'm not sure if I included that above, so apologies, but make sure that's installed and loaded. And once that is, you can use the Cartogram count function to create a continuous count of your population count of Surrey LSO. Now I'm just going to call this new data frame cart. You should see, yes, um, this warning sign on the bottom. This is nothing to worry about. This is just R doing its maths. Right, that's stopped. And now we can again just use ggplot to plot this cart function. Um, we use the same geom underscore sf aesthetic to do so. And if we have a quick look, we'll see that we have this really like distorted image, but this is what cartograms do. This is a type of um, basically like continuous map that um, helps to represent the different geographic areas that are modified based on our population count. So this is what we see here. Um, we can also apply some aesthetics to this. So we we'll, first step is just to fill this in with our population count variable. And as you can see, now we have the population count variable and it identifies areas with higher or lower population count. The next step is then to um, add in some aesthetics, which are quite, just, just make that map a little bit nicer. Um, yeah. I didn't really explain which each what each of these do, but they're not um they're, they're all available via like the help package, so you can just see what those do. And yeah, this leads us to activity three. So we have mapped the variable pop count work, but in this in this activity, you can re replicate kind of the same same maps we have made, but with the pop count residential variable. And then we can compare the differences between using workday and residential. The first step is to calculate your crime rate, and then we can start plotting this. So I'll give you, I realize we're very short for time, but I'll give you uh, five minutes just to, to have a go at this. Um, I might even cut that a bit short, but yeah, just give a few minutes. and. Yeah, I just want to point out uh, lots of people, if you're not used to working in R or, or coding or sort of using lines of code like this, you might feel it's cheating to copy, paste, and then just change the relevant variables. It is not at all. That is basically how coding works. So you can um, absolutely copy and paste the lines of code above that are relevant and change the the bits, you know, the name of the file that you're creating or the, you know, variable that it's pointing to or something like that. Just change the bits you need to. That's mm -hmm. a lot faster than trying to write it out. And mm -hmm. you're less likely to make mistakes. And that's exactly why I've included partial codes because they are very, very similar. Um, and there's no need to completely memorize, you know, line by line. You can make your life easier and create shortcuts. So. Okay, well, hopefully you've had enough time just to run through these activities. Um, I'm going to do this quite quickly, but uh, just because of time. So in this instance, I've asked you to look at the variable um, clock count res, which represents the residential population. So the first step is to identify that variable. Um, we are dividing the count by the residential population, oh, and then timesing by 1,000, as that's the average size of an LSOA. And then we can plot this using ggplot. So we call on our data set, which is the Surrey LSOA, and we fill this with our new 
crime count or crime rate, sorry. You might have noticed I've called this crime rate too, just so that we have both, um, both rates available in our data set. Again, you can override this, but you just need to remember what, what is what. So now if we run that, you should have a ggplot with your crime rate too. There we are. It should look something like this. And I've also asked you to do the same with your um, with the tmap function. Again, you just call your variable here, your crime rate two. I'm again just using the quantile classification system. Just to interrupt briefly, uh, another user has shared postcodes.io website and postcodes.io capital R is an R package. Either that website or the R package might be quite useful if you're moving between postcodes and latitude and longitude. Yeah, I was getting the error because I didn't um, put in quotation marks. Simple things like that will throw you off, but errors are really common in, in R, so don't let that throw you off. Um, and then I've just used the um, Tmaps arrange function for question four. So here I'm asking you to compare the crime rates. So you would supply your name of the variables in quotation marks this time. And you would do the same for your crime rate too. So we run both of these. And then we can put in our new objects, which are called ENF. And you can run that like so. Um, and then our last function is the cartograms. But um, yeah, so we would use the sorry. Spell it right. Sorry, LSRO. And you would fill this with your pop count. Is that what it's called? The variable pop count res? Hopefully. Yep. Okay. And then we have a cartogram of what other, other residential population. You can see huge differences that residential population is much more densely populated than your work day. So these are just things to consider. Um, but yeah, we haven't got much time left, so we'll end the demo here. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks for attending. Bye.